Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 304 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. So happy that you are here with me today um, on this rather crisp day in almost winter in New Zealand. Might be heading to summer where you are. I am so happy that we are here today talking to Catherine Prendergast. It was so awesome to talk to her. She is fascinating and fun and funny. And we talk about the lying and the truth. Um, something that I'm always fascinated with, because even as fiction writers, if that's what you do, you're using your fiction to tell the truth. And uh, if you're writing memoir, you're using your memoir to tell the truth, even if you are telling things not exactly as they were, you're, but you're trying to make them more truthy as it were. Um, see my book, Fast Draft Your Memoir, for more on that. Uh, what is going on around here? We will be on that fabulous interview in a moment. Um, I will skim through what's happening around here because it's all good. Um, I'm still loving Seven Miracles, still really enjoying the first drafting process and following where it goes. And it is going in some interesting and new directions. I had a character walk on the stage and then demand to be made into a different character who was already on the page. And the way that I do that is I am keeping basically a running track, an outline of what I have written. And then I just make myself some, note, some notes on that outline of what I will change in revision. So I can always go back and look at that outline and judge my book against it not judge it. You can't judge a first draft, but think about my book in light of the outline, but I don't go back and revise on the page uh, because for most of us, that's what trips us up and keeps us locked in chapter 17 for six years. So we try not to do that, but we do let ourselves think about the book and um, talking about myself here. And it's been super, super fun doing that. And I just keep moving forward. So let's Keep our fingers crossed that that keeps going because I am on a pretty tight deadline for this one. Um, so that is what I've been doing almost all day, every day is, uh, you know, and by that, I mean, three or three to five hours of work a day, which for me is my absolute upper max limit for doing first draft and creation work. But I did want to share something with you. I'm going to bring something up on my phone here because um, there's an announcement has come out about one of my friends and I have been wanting to share this with you and she will be on the show quite soon. But I just saw the Publishers Marketplace uh, announcement today. So now we can talk about it. Before I say that, I just want to remind people who may need this reminder, I truly believe that this is the best time to be a writer in the whole history of the world. Human beings, as we know human beings, have been around for maybe 200,000 years. R the written language, any written language, has been around for about 3,000 years. The internet has been around for, as we know it. Uh, the internet actually started about 50 years ago, but as we know it, it's less than 30 years old. And being able to self-publish yourself easily with a click of a few buttons has been around for fewer than 12 years. Maybe remember we're inching into 13 years now. So in the history of the world, in the history of 200,000 years of humankind, there have been 12 years where we get to do what we want to do if we want to self-publish, if we want to indie publish. Traditional publishing is always fantastic to want and to reach for and to aim for. Absolutely. If that is your goal, keep reaching for it, write a book, query it. If you query, I always say this, if you query a hundred agents and can't get anything, well, this whole time you've been writing another book while you've been querying, right? So you put that book aside, you decide maybe do I want to self-publish this or do I want to just put it in a drawer? You can think about that, but the next book is your focus. Um, and then perhaps you'll self-publish it and perhaps you will have happened to you what happened to my friend, A.K. Mulford. Let me please read this announcement from Publishers Weekly to you. A.K. Mulford's The Five Crowns of Ulcrith series, the queer fantasy romance series, the first of which went viral on TikTok to David Pomerico at Voyager in a major deal for seven figures in a five book deal for publication in October 
2022 by Jessica Waterston at Sandra Dykstra Literary Agency World English UK Writes to Voyager UK. Yeah, yeah, my friend AK, who lives here in New Zealand, published a fantasy novel, a YA fantasy novel, a queer YA fantasy novel with characters, people of color, like oh just oh, was so delicious and yummy and uh it did real well like the the that announcement says went viral on tiktok her book did not go viral on tiktok people noticed her book because people talk about books on tiktok but she didn't have a particular you know she didn't have one video that went viral and started selling all these books for her she's just on tiktok and she's talking about it and her target readers are on TikTok and they're talking about it. And guess what? Harper noticed her. Harper went to her and said, we'd like to publish your books. And uh, we'll talk about this more with AK, AK when she's on the show. But um, I'm assuming, <laughs> I don't know what word she used, but she was already making real good money, y'all. She was making real good money, real good money on that first book. And then on the second book which came out also last year in 2021. And uh, they were going to have to offer quite a bit of money to quit making that kind of money. And they did above, above seven figures. That's all I could say, but above, above, above seven figures. And isn't that exciting that we live in a time where that can happen or that does happen. She wasn't going on around knocking on doors. She was just writing the best book she could, getting the best editing, the best cover. You should see her covers are gorgeous. And then putting them up there and, and making people aware of them as she could. She did no advertising, none, not a dollar's worth of advertising. And they came to her. It still happens. Okay. I just wanted to share that with you because I am so thrilled for my friend. I'm like, my cheeks hurt. We have been bugging her for like, I don't know two months now, a month and a half. When can we talk about this? When can we say it? And you can never say anything in publishing until it hits publisher's marketplace. And it is in terms of traditional deals. And it is official because by then it's too late. You've signed the contract and they can't, no one can yank anything out from anyone else. So um, please take heart. This is a fantastic time to be writing and publishing. Okay. On that happy, happy note, let's jump into the interview with Catherine. Here is her bio. Catherine Pen Prendergast is a professor of English at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Urbana-Champaign? I don't know how to say that. A Guggenheim Fellow and a Fulbright Scholar. Interviewed by NPR and New York Magazine, she has written on battles over school desegregation, anxieties over the global spread of English, and recognition of disability rights. Dr. Prendergast's previous scholarly books include Buying into English and Literary and Racial Justice. The Gilded Edge is her first work of narrative nonfiction. Oh, and it's so fascinating. Uh, originally from New Jersey, she now lives in central Illinois, Illinois with her husband and son. Please get some of your writing done. Please get some of your writing done so that you can share it with others. And please now enjoy this interview. And I wish you all very happy writing. Thanks for being here. Well, I could not be more pleased to welcome Catherine to the show. Catherine, hello. Will you please uh, share your name's pronunciation with us and your pronouns? Yeah, so I'm Catherine Prendergast, spelled how it sounds, and she, her. Perfect. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to talk to you. I am bowled over by this bio, and I'm super bowled over by uh, the premise of your book, which is at the top of my TBR pile and I haven't broken into it yet, but it is catnip to me. Thank you for writing the book that I needed to read. So we're going to talk about The Gilded Edge. Um, but before we do that, I would love to talk to you about your writing process, because that's also my catnip. Mm. <laughs> what does your writing process look like right now in your day-to-day -day life as you are a busy human being? Okay. So I'm a, a mom yeah. of a teen and a oh. professor at the University of Illinois. So right you have also like 400 other young adults under your, under your wing as well. Yeah. yeah. So, so my writing process may look a little different from someone who's a freelance writer, who's, oh, good. you know, entire income relies on churning out daily, yeah. you know, um, pubs. But so uh, mine is very protracted. It starts always with research. It is using my background as an academic to go into archives and dig and dig and dig. Um, my, 
motto when looking at stuff is kind of you remember that house um show that was big. Yeah, of course. I, I loved, I had a big crush on him. Yeah. So yeah, who didn't? So <laughs> everybody lies, right? So that's my motto yeah. when I go into the archives, everybody lies. So when I, I read that. letters, when I read newspapers, when I read everything, um, I just presume, presume they're lying until I can yeah. like triangulate it with another source. So every time I find something that's interesting, I'm like, ah, I wonder if that really happened. So I often will take the letters and go to the newspapers. It goes to the newspapers, go to the letters and then the diaries. But the people I'm writing about, which were a uh, bohemian kind of influencers of the day who started colony in Carmel, California around the first decade of the 20th century. I mean, they lied to everybody, to their friends, to the papers. And I even found he lied in his diary. And it, oh, so, so a lot wow. of what I do starts with kind of like, what is going on? Just getting the basics. And from then I sort of go from where, who to highlight based on the voice, the voice that comes out of the letters is so important to me because without that, you don't really have a story. You don't have character. You don't have anything. So when somebody's voice in a letter captivates me, um, that's where I start from. And in the case of the Gilded Edge, it's this poet, um, Norma French, who is self-administering an abortion in 1907 and writing her boyfriend a letter about it as she is self-administering, going through the cramps and everything. So like, yeah. Oh my right. gosh, so after that's I read that And she's like brilliant and clever and raw. And I was like, okay, this is a book about her. Yeah. So I would love to go into the weeds a little bit. Um, in terms of details with how you capture research uh, for the Gilded Age, let's 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 use that. Um, how long did it take you to research it before you really started writing? And and where do you? I I I can't remember which writer it is, but they keep they still keep three by five note cards, which I think is the most romantic thing oh, ever, but wow. not very searchable. Do you no. use Evernote? Do you use Scrivener? What? How are you doing this? Yes. Uh, so I have thousands of documents, and I you know as I mentioned, I have a kid. So when I go to an archives. I'm, I'm taking photos as fast as I can in my uh, phone that go to yes. Evernote and automatically back up to the cloud. That is like thing one. I name the notebook after the archive I'm in. It's oh, like dated smart. to the thing I did. I named the file where I found it, who to who. Um, yeah, so I am really on a recovery mission when I'm there. And I may get to read a little, but I cannot get bogged down and read, you know, especially if somebody's handwriting is bad, but we're like, yeah. we'll read that later. <laughs> so, so that's a big one. Evernote is key. Um, and it's, it's key that everything that's not handwritten is keyword searchable. I think there's a few other ways to do it, but there's, there's very little paper involved. I have my computer there. If there's uh, something I want to see again, I will go back to it. I'll write a note, look at this thing. Uh, the worst is when they don't allow much photography, which, you know, one archive, the Berg, which is very hoity-toity in the New York Public Library, allowed you to take 20 pictures per visit. And I had, you know, hundreds of letters between Ambrose Bierce and the main character of my story to get through. And I was like, oh my God. So I typed like 90 words a minute. So I was having to transcribe on the fly. That is less than ideal. That is less than ideal. And also it's really um, a privileged position of, you know, saying you must have enough time and disposable income to be able to stay in town and spend four days um, reading and writing all this stuff. Oh, I don't like that. Yeah. So when I Come go, on, um, you know, I'm, I'm from Jersey and I'm, you know, I've traveled all, I, I have a wide varied life and I've got friends wherever. Um, so sometimes I'm crashing with them, but more lately I, I need a hotel room because, you know, as the project went on, this is my time to be alone and write without no cats, without kid, yeah. without, you know, students, whatever's going on. So I like bring, you know, a cup of soup, which I've learned how to make in the Keurig. You know? <laughs> That's <laughs> so awesome. Sure I have a mini fridge for like bread and cheese and jam and like, you know, whatever. And I don't even like leave if I have a day where the archives are closed and I could just brrr, get through. So I'm pretty much machine. I usually schedule one night with friends to hang out because I will get lonely. I know I will. And uh, lately I schedule a massage because oh, it's yes. really hard to be, this is very important researcher writers, to have your neck down for a full week for like eight hours, you know, and you're just 
running to, you can't bring food in the archive. So you're like running out for 20 minutes to get a banana and a power bar and running back in. Um, there's also some website, how cold is that library? <laughs> you can check out too, because you need to know. <laughs> What a great point. They're all climate controlled for really good reasons, but exactly. So my process is all about maximizing my time. Now I did start this um, project. I got a Guggenheim uh, award that allowed me to travel a lot and a semester off. So uh, during that time I did sort of the initial research and it was a broader project I got the award for, which included four different writer colonies at the turn of the century. Once I found this letter, I was like, this one is first, we start here. Um, so really helped me narrow down. Are, are there going to be more books for oh, the yeah. other colonies? Oh, that's so cool. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm not gonna awesome. talk about it. <laughs> oh no, of course not. I would not ask you to, yet, but, but that yeah. is very exciting. So then when, yeah. um, speaking to the process again, when you're home and actually doing the writing, what does that look like? Where do you fit it in? Well, I try to get one writing day a week, you know, and uh, some weekends because it's really hard to get enough time uh, when you're teaching. And um, as a professor, I have a lot of service. I have grad students. It's not just the time yeah. in the classroom. So really, it's, it's I will designate, you know, this is my day I write or this is, you know, one week a year. I meet my girlfriend who's a poet, Kristen oh. Bach, whose new uh, poetry book, Glass Bikini, is out. One of the poems of which is chosen for Best American Anthology 2022. Ah, yeah, we'll have to reach out to her. Right. And I'm not a poet. And she has a huge imagination. And I have none. So, you know, we're very different kinds of writers. But we rent a fishing cottage in Martha's Vineyard every week, which we will do till we die. And it's like one bedroom. And she sleeps on the, you know, the ground floor. And I sleep on the one bedroom thing. And we just write till about 4.43. And then she goes, is it cocktail hour yet? <laughs> then we have cocktails walk across to the fish market have dinner and just watch the monet painting of you know the scenery as it changes yeah that sounds, sounds idyllic crazy. that sounds absolutely it is idyllic. we always play the song tom waits is um is it no lou reads it's such a perfect day at the beginning of the uh, trip anyway <laughs> so yeah i i rely on getting a lot of my writing done out of town there's yeah. just a ton yeah, so that's really hard. Now, when the pandemic hit, I had to finish the book and my husband was going through a surgery. I learned to write in the Northwestern Hospital waiting room. Uh, you know, I just learned to be less fussy. I love that phrase, learn to be less fussy. I we can all be as, be. we can be as yeah. fussy as we want until we have no more room to be fussy. And if you're not doing and a deadline. work and a deadline, it's like, it's a beautiful thing. It's really yeah. one of my favorite things in life. What is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? Um, for me, it's uh, turning what I know into a story. And mm -hmm. I would say to other academics that I had to learn how to write creative nonfiction, you know, uh, based on fact. And so I do narrative nonfiction. And so for me, the narrative part, um, I hope my next book isn't as protracted because I feel like now I know the elements that make a story. Yeah. You know, now I know you have to focus on a couple of characters. Now I know nobody cares if you're right or not, or if, you know, <laughs> they want to yeah. feel something in this story, right? So it's slowing down to get people to know who the characters are. And another um, real issue is having empathy for all the characters with my agent, uh, Anna Sproul Latimer, kind of you know, really focuses on because initially when I was writing this story, there are two main women and I, I gravitated towards one more than the other. And it took me a while to sort of see the other person's point of view. And now when mm. I see it and I could, you know, sympathize with their position, that writing became easier. So that's it. You know, the emotional connection yeah. with the characters. I think it feel, I, I think it might be easier and also it'll feel truer in every way to you yes. the, the writer and the reader i was uh, I, I heard something earlier of a uh, hayao miyazaki quote uh, who did the spirit of the way movies and uh, he doesn't he says he never writes about evil characters he writes about um 
good characters trying to do good, but also looking into the the difficult places inside them. And that's where things get really interesting when we yeah, look at the whole my character. My son loves those movies. And They're so good. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it's also truer to history because a lot of the yeah. things that people are doing, you, I mean, like, you know, a hundred years ago, what were the choices <laughs> that women had? So um, understanding the entire frame in which they're living their lives and making their decisions. And you can look back a hundred years and be like, well, why didn't she divorce right. him, you know, or, right. or whatever, you know, be stronger. Just, yeah. They didn't, they didn't right. know how. they weren't yeah. trained. So mm -hmm. what is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? Well, I mean, first in the archives, it's the thrill of discovery. It's like when I find something that um, is like, whoa, you know, or, or something that just makes me roll my eyes because it's so ridiculous. And um, yeah. there's a ridiculous, really, like, if you hate an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, this is like, you will hate this one character in there who is always trying to come off, you know, as, anyway, it causes just wreckage all over the place. Because so, people um, are people back then and now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll text a letter to a friend of mine who's, you know, following the story and be like, look what George did this time, you know. <laughs> That is so juicy. That is so yeah. So it's so that, um, and in the writing part, it's like when I finally get it. When I finally get sort of why they did what they did. When I understand it fully and am able to sort of just tell it. And it, I've said this in other um, interviews, but I think in I got kind of hung up on the the relative sparsity of women's uh, records related to men. And this is a book about. Um, finding the story as much as it is the story itself. I take you with me to the archives to show like, here's the, the place where they crossed out, you know, what she, what she experienced. Here's where they ripped it. Here's where they burned it. You know, um, these archives are largely trails left by men. And so you have to go that extra mile to find women's, you know, documents. And then you have to go that extra mile to kind of connect the dots and, you know, yeah. And to uncover the actual truth and to look behind the, the, the truth of everybody lying and, and figure out yes. what that is and then display that in an interesting narrative way. Like this is an, an enormous challenge. It is. Uh, it yeah. is. And yeah. And it, in my case, um, I mean, you could see it has to do with cyanide. People die, you know, so <laughs> and there is the thriller. You know, that's a thriller writer in me face. That's what that face was. Yes, they die. Yeah, there's um, <laughs> that wasn't the human cyanide. Three people die of cyanide. And um, in one case, I'm not very clear um, the circumstances under which that happens. And so I take the reader through that. You know, you're in a kind of true crime situation. Like, you know, <laughs> could you really? Yeah hold a dead body for an hour and not know it was dead. Yeah, that sort of thing. <laughs> I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Um, okay, so can, can you share a craft tip of any sort with us? Yeah, um, one thing I would say that I am pretty ruthless about is editing. <laughs> tell me, tell me more. Yeah, so I used to have a girlfriend who wrote very big books, right? And I remember she, I mean, this is not her book, this is my book, but she was gi giving her launch and she says, in my dreams, I cut this in half, right? <laughs> it, was like, it was an academic book. And so I really, you know, I was like, all right, I know my job, you know, when we next meet. So really it is, does this need to, you know, I like pace. I mm. don't like things that, you know, get in the way of the story. So for me, I have to slow down and give more detail and richness. For other people, I feel like, all right, you know, but what is happening now? Like you Why already, do I like, carry done... about the, the carriage maker of that time? This has no relevance to the story. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Like, so there's, again, a little cliffhangers at the end of every chapter in this book where I'm trying to kind of leave you in... The moment when I leave the archive, as it were, and I'm suspended in animation because I know more, but I still don't know enough. <laughs> so. What is that frustration like, too? That 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 as much as you know, you will never know all of it. How does how does that feel? I'm utterly at peace with it, to be honest. What? what? Wow. Yeah, I mean, because because you can't, and uh, yeah. if you did, where where's the fun in life? You That's know, a like good point. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you, the fun is doing the jigsaw puzzle. Then you finish and you're like, eh, what do I do? Laminate it? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I was not expecting that answer from you. And I absolutely love it. Thank you for that. Thank right. you. So it annoys me at the time when I'm like, okay, right. I've got to find this out. I've got to find this out. I mean, but, but it comes a time, you know, where you realize like, you're not ever going to know everything about the past. And that is sort of the message that we should, it's one of humility that we should take yeah. to understanding the present and that, you know, you're not going to know everything. How you're do not. you then, how do you then decide going back to your idea of this revision? How do you decide between darlings? when you are, when you know that something's got to go, how do you end, but you love both pieces next to each other. How do you decide? Uh, the one that is sort of truer to the voice of the character, yeah. let's say, like yeah. puts you in their world better. And in some cases, you know, I quote the letters. In other cases, I'm sort of inside their mind and paraphrasing like an amalgam of letters, but that will show you like sort of what they were thinking about around this time. Right. So, yeah. so I've chosen to take that kind of point of view. Um, and maybe that's a little bit generically, you know, I don't know, uh, breaking boundaries or whatever, but um, I, I dispensed with, cause it really just for me is a pace killer. The must have thought I just, <laughs> you know, at the beginning, I'm like, I'm drawing connections. Oh, here. I love I'm that. doing the dots and I'm, so I'm not going to say, 50 million times must have felt must, must have, have thought. thought could have could have felt could have felt yeah. almost certainly yeah. blah 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 and I just was like thank Labor. you I don't want it so yeah okay that is that's brilliant um what thing in your life affects your writing in a surprising way uh this is a tough one um death so uh, yeah yeah so this is a story about women and three women friends of mine died of metastatic breast cancer while I was writing it. Holy so crap. I'm so sorry. That, yeah, it was, it was rough. So that raised for me, I, I started to think about how people are remembered and how we cherish and remember friends and mm. whose lives get lauded and for what. And even people who, you know, don't have publications or whatever, you know, but who just left a wonderful garden. In one case, one mm -hmm. friend, you know, I have pieces of her garden in my garden. And there's, this is about, you know, women who are all dead and um, how they were and were not remembered and how their stories were in some way used and abused um, in service of, you know, a certain <laughs> legacy building for men or even uh, California real estate building in the case of Carmel. So, you know, that really to me raised the stakes and yeah. I became more and more radical as I was writing it. I love that. And, and what a, what a huge thing to affect all parts of it. It's going to affect your writing and it's also going to affect the way you remember these women. And it's going to affect every friendship that you have now and will ever have. It all Absolutely. informs each other. Absolutely. There was one that just sent me on a spiral, like the, the, you know, middle one. And I was just like, I had to take a little bit of a leave, you know? Yeah. So it, it's, it, you just cannot force, I think yeah. the situation I read something today online. It was like, when you've written a bad thing, it's better than the good thing, than not writing at all or whatever. And yeah. I'm like, to a point, you know, to a point there's, we shouldn't give ourselves license to write every story. And by us, I mean, white women. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Sometimes, you know, you should have the moment to be like, that's not my story. Not my and story. I should let's, not be writing let's that. Listen. Let's yeah. listen and make space for the yeah. For the there are some things where I'm like, mm, maybe that that shouldn't have been written, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or published or whatever. But um, so I I think it's you know I'm not a you must write every day because writing every day is the way you got to do it. I'm very much more you know it it's hitting now. Get it done, you know. Mm, thank you for that. Now we come to the question, uh, which is the preparation one. Uh, what's the best book that you've read recently? You know, and I thought about this it? and, and I, I'm probably supposed to say something written by a woman, given my emphasis on this thing, but honestly, or even in the, you know, historical nonfiction, no, you know, the best one I've read recently that I so enjoyed uh, was James B. Whiteside's Center Center. It's a, James B. Whiteside is a principal dancer at the American Ballet Theater. Um, and he is queer AF. And he just 
blasted the ballet memoir all to hell, which usually begins with inspiration and then abuse and then uh, and persevering. And he's just like, it's so funny. It's like reading David Sedaris. Like that's most amazing. of it isn't even about ballet, which when you read the reviews, that's a complaint. And I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm, you know, my son does dance and I did dance, you know, earlier in life. I'm like, ballet memoir is like, what, is, you know, I'm sorry, but ballet dancers have 80% the same life. <laughs> <laughs> like they're 80 percent doing the same time to at the same time you know approximately 10 10 in the morning you know like what are, why do you want like those memoirs are all the same you know and this gave me such delight and was so raunchy and hilarious and he pointed out like you know i'm this queer guy but you know, 90% of my life is portrayed by, you know, mastering this heterosexual prince. And, um, and, and so it's full of like touching truths. I laughed, I cried, it became a part of me. Center Center by James Whiteside, who by the way, a month ago landed and busted up his knee, like <laughs> ruptured the back of his knee. So by his book, because that's a horrifying thing to happen at age yes. 36 when you're in the top of your craft. Oh my gosh. No, I will. Uh, it's going directly below your book now on my TBR pile. So thank you very much for that. that, that <laughs> I don't know that, him personally. I just want to be like, clear. <laughs> no, absolutely. No, pet memoir is my passion. But if you follow him so... on Instagram, you will see his kneecap recap uh, videos, which are hilarious. <laughs> Do you read thriller at all? Yeah. So um, I also read um, a lot of usually Irish, like the Tanya oh, I love French the Irish books. ones. Um, I am um, what's her right name? Now, um, um, I had a little surgery myself recently, and I got through four or five books, five of audiobooks of Adrian McKinty, um, who's Belfast, her. Belfast Noir. Mm -hmm. And how about um, Val McDermott? It is like so, you know, got the voice. And I have an Irish grandmother, so it feels a little like coming home, you know. Oh, so I love that. that's what I listened to while I was recovering from surgery. So th that stuff. I'm going to look, I'm going to look into, um, and Adrian. I just and do that. Cool. Yeah. I binge watch, you know, Scando Noir, like crazy. I love Scando Noir. So the one I'm going to tell you about, you may or may not like, um, I have not finished it, but it's called, they never learn by Lynn Fargo. And the reason I'm bringing it up is it's, it's pretty, it's pretty fun right now. It's two points of view. And one point of view is a, co a young college student, um, in this university. And the other point of view is the serial killer, academic who is involved in um, trying to find out more about this woman's work maybe a hundred years ago but really coming against all of like her famous husband's papers who and basically erased her and then the the male erasure My of god i've got to read that you've got to read it you got and How i can't i can't it? vouch that it's part i think it just came out yeah uh, yeah, oh I would have called I'm again. Kidding. They never I'm learn. Kidding. Yeah. And I can't, I haven't finished this. So I can't vouch for it sticking the landing, but I think that it will. So yes, yes. Recommend. Great. Great. Uh, okay. Great. Now let's come back to you. And can you please tell us about the Gilded Edge? Okay. So it. the Gilded Edge, my book right here. I don't know where the camera is anymore. Da -da -da -da. Oh, it blurs it out. Yeah. It that's, blurs it out. It doesn't. That's okay. Funny. <laughs> so it is about um have you been to Carmel? You you're from California originally? I, I spent a lot of time in Carmel. My dad's best friend had a home there on the on Ocean Drive. So we would spend yep. a few weeks every summer there growing up. Right. So tell people a little bit about Carmel as I Oh my gosh. Carmel is so rich, so <laughs> but rich but hippy dippy. And you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Rich so, but hippy dippy. It's like famously, what? Who was the mayor who wouldn't let them eat ice cream uh, Clint, outside? Oh, Clint Eastwood, oh, wasn't it? Clint Eastwood was the mayor it, for a while. It was Clint Eastwood, and he made the law that you couldn't eat ice cream outside because it, a child might drop ice cream on the sidewalk, and that would look messy. Right. So <laughs> you can't wear high heels. You have to get a permit to wear high heels. Um, the weirdest thing once it's beautiful. was beautiful. I needed a coke while I was doing research in the library oh, good archives luck. there. Like it was ten o'clock at night. And so I'm running around looking for a vending machine. And finally, I run into somebody. I was like, where's the vending machine? He's like, there are no vending machines in Carmel. I'm like, of course, I have to go to a bar, <laughs> sit there, pay for a freaking Coke. Because um, nothing else was open. You know, there's ordinances about how many newspaper racks. You I don't think there's have. any drive throughs I mean, allowed. Yeah. 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 So, so when you go, it's wonderful place to um, vacation. It is a weird place to have to work. <laughs> 
And it's, uh, it started out as one square mile that somebody bought in 1902 because the Southern Pacific Railroad was supposed to extend from Monterey, but never did. And all of California land development is about the railroad. It's driven yes. by the railroad. So he buys this and the, the lots aren't selling. So he's like, you know, what's, how can I market these lots? And um, so he basically gets this group of bohemian writers from San Francisco that are already known there and uh, to move there. I had no idea. To write letters to all their friends and to recruit people to move there. You are going to love this. It's an MLM. It's a pyramid scheme. It is entirely an MLM, right? And then it all kind of like falls apart, you know, tragically, because even in these very bohemian uh, enclaves, as we know, there's a lot of sexism. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of loosened uh, sexual codes for which the women pay all the consequences. And uh, as it turns out, there's um, a cyanide, you know, <laughs> in, in the house of the person who founded it. And uh, yeah, so the person who founded it is his wife and um, Nora Mae French, the poet, all die of cyanide. Not all at the same time, though. There was a myth that uh, it was a cyanide cult, that the whole mm -hmm. group, you know, of them always carried cyanide in their person to dispatch themselves. Well, I couldn't actually find anything that bolstered that. That came from one source. But I kept looking, and uh, the reality of what happened is actually a lot more um, mundane, tragic, and meaningful to today. But they were just burnishing their own legends and um, so on and so forth. I will say what drew me to it was uh, I was something of a hippie uh, in my past. And, you know, uh, my boyfriend at the time was so charismatic, people would move wherever he moved. So I felt like I knew this group, you know, like it was yes. just like very, very tight knit. And, um, and you'd have kind of your own code, you know, as a group. Mm -hmm and your own sort of lifestyle and co-going. And then terrible things would happen. And the emotional toll of that wouldn't hit you until years and decades later. So wow. anyway, that's what the book's about. So Carmel is the is beautiful scenery and backdrop for it. And um, I, I really want to hear what you think. Having I am going to tell you, I am, I, I'm crazy about yeah. the Pacific Grove. You do know that all those trees, yeah, all those trees yeah. on Ocean Drive are fake in that they're not native to there. They planted oh, them to give it a Mediterranean feel. The to give it the feel, yes. The, and by yeah. they, I mean the Chinese workers that they call Japanese. So, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, and yet, I still like you know you know the eucalyptus that were introduced by Junipero Serra, and uh, uh, but but I but I still love the cypress. Like I called my first. Um, oh, it's great series cypress hollow just because it's just so beautiful but i but yeah invasive species so oh yeah it's Catherine, enraging it, and captivating and i did go back for my one in-person you know thing at launch and um they were great you know they they listened to me say some hard things about the town <laughs> what's the bookstore what's the bookstore it's not monarch but what is it uh, there's a the pilgrim's way that's there oh okay um, yeah yeah i like that one yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. They were they were so warm to me. And I'm walking back to my best Western hotel and passed a fifty-two thousand uh, dollar necklace in the hotel. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. It's, it's like a Beverly Hills Berkeley, maybe. Yes, that's perfect. <laughs> that is perfect. And I finally brought my husband back. I said, I want to actually vacation in Carmel. <laughs> But a first re proofreader of a bad draft, like she was so enchanted. She made her next vaca vacation there. Like, I think I'm, you know, I'm not putting anybody off. I'm saying it is amazing and beautiful. <laughs> it's really got this be, weird background. I don't know. I'm seeing a, a Catherine Prendergast tour, perhaps. Yeah, of, I know. Of, of I, local I spots. hire me to say, oh, and this is there. <laughs> Catherine, it has been an absolute total delight to talk to you about writing Thank and about this so book. Um, I wish you all continued success and I cannot wait to continue following you.